Okay, I'm going to insert a little physical health here and tell you that as I do the introduction to this panel, if you want to stand up and stretch for a minute, you're free to do that. I know that you can listen to me as well as stretch at the same time. I could see a little, little lace that's going on there. Okay, in this next panel, what we're actually doing is looking again, continuing on in terms of the intersection between mental health dysfunction and risk for violence. If any of you have been clinicians, you know that one of the hardest things is when a family member comes up and asks you, why couldn't you tell? And why didn't you know? And did I miss something? So the issue of detection is um, very critical. It's one in which um, you know, we are questioning the tools that we have. We sometimes question ourselves. Uh, people doubt themselves in terms of you know, missing things. So this is an issue that we all are looking forward to our panelists talking about. Uh, the way we're going to do it is we'll have each of the presentations, and then we'll do the questions at the end after um, all have finished. Um, and I will introduce each one one by one. So uh, we're going to start with Sienna Fazell. And as you know, each of these panelists have a long, distinguished bio that's in there. So we've been asked to just say a few of the wonderful things about them. And for Sienna, um, he is with the Wellcome Trust and he is a senior research fellow and a honorary consultant. And his research focuses on the relationship between mental illness and violent crimes, also on the mental health of prisoners, and as well on violence risk assessment. And one of the nice things about having someone whose data sometimes is outside of the US is that the data sources in other countries sometimes have unique identifiers that allow his data to um, reveal more than sometimes we can get from ours. So as you've seen, his name has popped up a few times in terms of some of his data. He's going to be talking about risk assessment for violence. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you very much for the invitation. It's been very enjoyable so far. Um, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm going to start um, because we don't have much time. Um, I'm basically going to talk about three things. Um, just give you a sort of primer on violence risk assessment. I'm mainly going to be talking about risk assessment for interpersonal violence. Um, I'm going to summarize some systematic reviews, that are, um, uh, try to synthesize the evidence, gives you an idea of where we're at, and then talk about some of the implications of that work and where we should be going. So, violence risk assessment. Well, it can be unstructured or it can be structured. Structured uh, means that there are tools which you can use which act as a proxy or even replace clinical judgment in some cases. Um, and there's a lot of them around. Um, last count was there was over 200 uh, different instruments that were out there. A lot of them marketed quite heavily um, uh, to assess violence risk. And they're widely used in some places, um, particularly um, uh, what, what, what we call forensic psychiatric services, um, and to some extent in criminal justice settings. Um, and different countries use them at different different points in the criminal justice setting, but often they're used pre-sentence to determine uh, how long someone should be in prison for. Um, I put a question mark against death penalty because there was some, uh, I've, I've read somewhere that in, in Texas it may have been used to determine that, so I'm, I'm not certain. And to uh, make decisions about parole and probation as well. There are three waves, so I mean, people talk about this unstructured clinical assessment. This is a clinician just deciding on the basis of their examination if someone is at high risk or not. And then we move to an actuarial system where you have a list of risk factors which were determined by research studies and you sort of tick them or you add them up. Uh, you know, sometimes there's zero, one, and two. You just score them and that gives you then a, a probability score. So you're, the individual you're speaking to has a 50% uh, chance of committing a violent offense in the next two years. It's, it's a bit like that, um, very precise. Um, and then um, uh, another set of instruments is called structured clinical judgment, where people use risk factors plus clinical assessment, and they come up with um, risk groups. So high, low, medium is the, is the usual categorization. And they don't give you a probability score. They just say it's high, low, medium. 
So here are some of the tools. I mean, I'm, I'm not sure how interesting it is to, to go into specifics, but you may have heard of some of them. Um, very well-known tool is the PCLR, which is the Psychopathy Checklist. Um, another very well-known tool is the HCR20, which is often used in psychiatric settings. Um, and I've included these nine because I'll come to talk about these nine later because they're the most common they use tools in the field. Um, so what is the evidence base for them? Well, um, there's quite a bit of... Uh, uh, so we, we looked in 2010 and we found 40 systematic reviews and meta-analyses. So you think, well, you know, that's, um, that should tell you that, uh, some of the um, information uh, we need about determining how good the evidence base is. But interesting enough, I mean, there are systematic reviews and there are systematic reviews. And you may know this from your own fields that... Um, often they disagree with each other. It's partly to do with, with methods, with selection criteria, but actually a lot of it's just to do with simple things like quality. Um, and half the systematic reviews that we saw in this field didn't um, exclude duplicates, so they were probably overestimating the effects of uh, a particular instrument. They didn't explore heterogeneity, which is the variation in, in um, the predictive uh, ability of these instruments, so what, what explains the wide variance um, uh, that, that sometimes is found. And, and uh, actually only six of the tools address predictive ability, so how well these, these tools predict. Most of the studies looked at um, other, other factors to do with, you know, are they different when they use in men versus women, or in, in uh, you know, other, other sort of comparisons like that. And the, st the statistical tests applied to these instruments were quite limited. They often were things like correlation coefficients, which are very difficult to interpret clinically. So uh, here's an example um, of the six, uh, six studies that looked at predictive validity. Guess what? They all found that um, these instruments do well. And actually, they mostly look at variations of the psychopathy checklist. So this is this PCLR. Um, so there were six, six studies, five of them on the psychopathy checklist and one on another instrument. So not a really great evidence base. So we thought, well, let's, let's try and update it and, and see what it says about the rest of the tools. So we did a new meta-analysis um, uh, um, which um, tried to um, address some of the limitations in the previous work. We tried to get hold of unpublished data, um, and we got hold of quite a lot of unpublished data because often it's not, it's not uh, presented in a way that's um, poolable synthesizable. Um, and we ended up with quite a large study of 73 samples, about 24,000 individuals who are risk assessed. And I'll just cut to the chase and tell you what they find. So I've, here's, a, here's a table. Um, here are um, broken down into um, tools that look at violent offending, sexual offending, and any criminal offending. Um, and the ends of the studies. Um, and what we've done is we, we present a range of different outcomes um, because we felt that uh, actually just giving one statistic isn't uh, may not be helpful actually there's a you need a range of statistics because people may wish to use these tools in different ways and the different uh, estimates to do with prediction are, are relevant uh, if you use them in different ways so I've highlighted three um, area under the curve is one that's often used um, and that gives you a sort of global measure of whether an instrument does well or not. Um, it's not very useful clinically, though. Um, uh, what's more useful clinically is the one below it, which is the positive predictive value, which is a way of saying, if an instrument determines your high risk, how well does it do? So how many of the people, does it, if it determines uh, its high risk, how many of those people go on to um, violently offend or sexually offend? And as you can see, it's, um, it's about 50-50. I mean, it's a bit like a coin toss, really. Um, so um, these instruments aren't very good at um, predicting um, violence if someone is identified as high risk. However, they're very good. If, if it predicts you as low risk, this thing called negative predictive value, it does quite well. So if an instrument says you're low risk, it ends up being right 91% of the time. Um, so in, in other words, 41% um, um, uh, went on to offend violently if identified at high risk. I think that's, I would call that moderate to low in terms of its um, positive predictive value. It's probably low. Um, um, if someone's identified at low risk, it does very well, I think, these instruments. Um, this, is, this is sensitivity. Um, 
and specificity, just um, other, other metrics which look at predictive validity. In so many words, it depends on how they're used, basically. Are these tools useful or not? Are they good at what they claim to be? It very much depends on how they're used. So if you want to use them at um, identifying um, those people generally at high risk, you know, broad groups, I think they, they do moderately well. I mean, that's the area you see, the area under the curve, and that can inform treatment and management plans. They're not very good to make very definitive decisions, such as those that are made by criminal justice about sentencing, release, discharge from hospital. That's not really what they can be used for. Um, uh, and they can be used to screen out low-risk individuals, which they're currently not used in this way, but um, we, we've argued that they could be used in this way. Um, how do they compare? One of the interesting questions we had is, well, how does it compare with the rest of medicine? Um, so there, there, there are lots of diagnostic tools um, in medicine, um, uh, and, they, and they compare very poorly. Maybe that's unfair, and we should be comparing them with prognostic tools. And the, the, most, the best known, most researched prognostic tools in medicine are in cardiovascular medicine. You've heard of the framing and risk score. In the UK, we have something similar called the Q-Risk, which you do with your general practitioner on their computer screen. You just go through five items, and it gives you a, a risk of a cardiovascular event in five, ten years, and then uh, determines whether you should be on a statin or not. Um, and actually, they, they, they're similar to those tools um, uh, in terms of the area under the curve, and, and, um, but the consequences of getting it wrong are different for these, for these risk prediction instruments, and therefore that needs to be thought about um, their, their costs in terms of detention, but also um, other costs, including training of staff to use them, time of staff, um, the time taken to um, fill these in and, uh, and discuss it with colleagues. What about in, in, in uh, specific populations with mental illness? So the, the, the review that we did um, looked at uh, every population we could find, mostly criminal justice, but some psychiatric populations. But are there, um, is, there, is there a bit more evidence if you look a bit more closely at mentally ill populations? And um, there are different instruments. So we then did another review where we looked at different, these different instruments for people that specifically were designed um, around mentally ill populations. And there, um, it's a little bit disappointing, really, to be honest, quite wide variation in their predictive validity. And only two looked at schizophrenia, which is a, um, a, a big interest in, in, in risk, risk prediction, because a lot of forensic patients have schizophrenia. And actually, a recent study uh, done by um, Jeremy Coyd in London found that these instruments may be worse in uh, psychopathy than they are in mental illness. Um, uh, an interesting study where they followed a high-risk cohort of prisoners on release, uh, followed them up for a year to see what happened. Um, um, and one of the other interesting things about these tools is the variation in, in what's in them. So there are 10 tools that we looked at. This is specifically tools that were designed around predicting violence in, in psychiatric populations. And the most powerful risk factor, the one that has the most weight, is criminal history factors. And as you can see, they, they don't really um, tend to agree very much on, uh, on, on which um, factors should be included. And you see quite a large um, uh, variation in the risk factors. And I think that reflects the evidence base that maybe could be strengthens a bit in this area. Um, oh, I, I, I wrote something about the, the Jeremy Coyd study um, because he found that with psych psychopaths it was less than 50% the positive predictive value. And that's uh, this how it was written up by uh, the headline writer, wrote, wrote, summarized it in that way. Um, so in summary, um, you can't predict. No great surprises there. Um, can't really be used to determine any precise risk of reoffending, um, in, in even in high risk populations. But I think it can roughly identify different risk groups, and that can help inform management. And it's a very, very expensive way, but it is nevertheless possible. It, it does remind people to ask about certain risk factors, and that can be useful in some settings. So, what should we do next? Well, use them differently, we've argued. Um, to screen out low-risk people, uh, and then you can focus your resources and uh, more elaborate assessments on the on the people that are left. You could develop new tools, which are more 
maybe diagnostic specific, um, which uh, build on uh, maybe a stronger evidence base, um, and that's where I would um, possibly think the field should go. Um, I think in, in, in this area, one needs to be a little bit aware of um, how research has done. There's um, um, uh, some work we've done which shows that there's an authorship bias, which is that people who develop these tools often do the subsequent validation studies, um, and um, those validation studies um, tend to have high rates of predictive validity. That might be because they're, they're using the tools better, but it might be that there's some other um, uh, um, issues which, which need to be at least made transparent. Um, and uh, so finally, I mean, improve research in three ways. I think it needs independent funding. It needs evaluation by impartial experts. Um, and it also needs the highest standards of evidence. So here, you know, really good quality epidemiology to inform what risk factors should go into these tools and then um, uh, ways of assessing their predictive validity that uses a range of outcomes, not just one, um, but a range um, reflects how they're used in practice. I think, um, oh yes, and, and can I just, uh, yeah, just as a side note, can, can they be improved by genetic, um, by adding genetic information? Well, we just did a mega review of all the genetic associations with violence, and um, it's quite disappointing, really. I mean, these are candidate genes, so the field's obviously moved on since since the, since people were looking at candidate genes. But if you look at all the candidate genes, uh, there isn't much really going on. Um, despite half the studies reporting in the abstracts, you know, significant findings, if you pull the data, um, there isn't really anything there um, so far. Um, Okay, um, thank you to the Wellcome Trust who fund me, my collaborators, that's it, thanks.